we pick it up in, in chapter 13, verse 1 says, That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. I'm going to stop right there for a second because we need to figure out what that same day, what had gone on that day, because uh, that kind of has a lot to do with why Jesus goes out of the house and goes and sits down beside the sea. The next verse says that the great crowds gathered around him, but at first it's just him going out of the house and going down beside the sea. Because this is a point where things are changing in the life of Jesus and his ministry. So to get a, get a clear understanding of this, let's go back a little bit. Let's go back to 1120 and see if some of the things that have happened. In 1120, we, Jesus had been uh, doing a lot of things. I'm just going to pick it up there. There's probably more things we could talk about. But in 1120, it says that he began to denounce cities where he had done a lot of miracles. It says, he be, in verse 20, it says, He began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done because they didn't repent. And remember, if you were here the week, uh, the last time I spoke, we had the, the pictures of Capernaum and, and these different cities and how uh, Jesus had cursed them. And he had said that it would be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. That's in verse 24. So he was saying th these great miracles had been done and these people had not repented. And so he continues on and, and you find that in verse tw chapter 12, uh, there's some things that happened on the Sabbath. His disciples had gone into a field and they helped themselves to some, some kernels of grain. And the, and the religious leaders, the Pharisees, got, got really upset about this and said, uh, you know, why are, why are these guys doing all these things on the Sabbath? Because they have to pick the grain, make the grain, and, and eat it. You know, it was too much. It was beyond their rules, right? So you have this uh, situation where Jesus says in chapter 12, verse 6, he says, I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. Okay? So he's talking about himself. He's saying there's something greater than the temple. And then the late, late, later on, verse 8, he says, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. He's saying, I am actually the Lord of the Sabbath. I'm the one that he's trying to talk about his Messiahship. So there's all these things going on where he's, he's doing these miracles and he's stating who he is. And all they can do is try to find a way to accuse him. Now they see him healing people, they see him doing all these incredible miracles. And in verse 9 it says that he enters the synagogue. This is chapter 12. I'm just reviewing a little bit here. And it says, a man was there with a withered hand. I'll stop a minute. So this guy's there with a withered hand, and they know that Jesus can heal him, right? And they also know that Jesus cares about him probably enough to heal him even on the Sabbath day. And it says, and they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? They're trying to say, hey, there's this poor guy here with a withered hand. You can't, you know, it's all messed up. And is it okay if you heal on the Sabbath? But they're trying to find a reason to accuse him of doing something wrong, you see? So he goes ahead and heals the guy. And in verse 14 of chapter 12, it says, The Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. So this whole time he's telling people who he is, he's healing people, he's showing compassion, and all they can do is accuse him and try to destroy him. They're conspiring against him to destroy him. So we go on a little further, and there's a demon-possessed man in chapter 12, verse 22, who's blind and mute, he can't see, he can't speak. And it says that Jesus healed him, and so the man spoke and saw, and he healed him of his demon possession. And the Bible says that when the Pharisees heard it, look at verse 24, 12, 24. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said it's only by Satan that the man, or Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man casts out demons. Now, Jared talked about this last week. I'm just pointing out the, the, the things about this. These guys, these Pharisees, heard about Jesus healing this demon-possessed man and said, oh, he's using Satan to do that. In, in the book of uh, Mark, in telling the same story, he says these guys came from Jerusalem. 
So these guys have come up from Jerusalem, and they say, oh, it's by Satan's power that Jesus is casting them out. And so Jesus, uh, Jesus speaks to them right there. In verse 28, he says, But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So he's saying, he, he, he tells them, it's the kingdom of God is coming, and it's the Spirit of God in me that's doing this, and you're accusing me of having Satan's power. And he talks there, I won't, won't go into it now, but blaspheming what the Holy Spirit is doing, actually doing and ascribing it to Satan. So the Holy Spirit is doing these great things and casting out these demons from people, and, and these guys are saying it's Satan. So there, there's this whole progression as we go through this of rejection, and not only rejection, but actively trying to kill him and then saying that he's actually got Satan in him and he's working for Satan. And it's kind of like the final straw. And then you pick it up in chapter uh, 12, verse 38. They have the gall to come to Jesus and say, some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. After all this stuff, after trying to kill him and everything, after doing these great miracles, they're saying, show us a sign. Do another, do another magic trick, you know. It was, it was such a, uh, I believe it was such a disappointment to Jesus. Uh, one of the things that uh, you can find out in, uh, let's see where this was here. Back in, in, the, in the part about the guy with the withered hand, back in 12, verse um, 10. In Mark, it says that Jesus was angry and he was grieved. He was angry at these people and he was grieved and that's, that's when he went ahead and healed the guy even though it was going to cause a lot of problems. So you have this situation where Jesus is, is doing all these things. And like uh, Jared said in, in the, talking about chapter 12, they weren't doing the things they wanted the Messiah to do. Okay? And in, 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 in the final straw is this thing about wanting to see a sign, right? They want to see a sign. And... And Jesus says, no, I'm not going to give you a sign, you evil, adulterous people. That's quite a thing. In other words, you're, you're going against your true, true God. You're evil. You are the evil people. You are the people who have betrayed God himself. And so he says in verse 39, No sign will be given to this generation except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something or someone or great, really the, the, the word says, behold, greater than Jonah is here. Didn't have any actual um, noun or pronoun. So, so it's just, there's some, something greater, someone greater than Jonah is here with you now. And they repented. Now, I thought it would be good for us to kind of look at that because it's what the, re, the preaching of Jonah was. So if you got your Bible, let's turn to Jonah. And this is kind of important. So find Jonah. It's after Obadiah. <laughs> it's just a very small book. So it's after uh, Ezekiel, Daniel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah. Okay, right there. <laughs> or you might have to look in the concordance. Or your index to find it. Or you have to navigate to it on your cell phone. <laughs> but the book of Jonah. Now you all know the story about Jonah being in the in the belly of the of the fish, being being the whole story you can read in the first three chapters, first two chapters. Uh, he finally gets to Nineveh after running away because he doesn't like these people. Now I'm trying to shorten the, the whole thing. 
And if you look in Jonah chapter 3 and verse 3, it says, Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three, day, three days' journey in breadth. That means it takes three days to cross this city. It's a big city. Okay? Jonah began to go into the city going a day's journey. So he goes one third of the way into, into Nineveh. Okay? And he calls up. This is his preaching. This is the preaching of Jonah that Jesus ref is referring to. This is what he says. Yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Now, as far as we know, that's all there is. That's all he says. So in, basically, Jonah goes into the city a little bit and goes, in 40 days you're all going to be dead. And then he, it says that he goes out of the city and he gets depressed and he pouts. Okay? <laughs> So what happens is, you can read it in from verse 6 to uh, the end of the chapter 3, what happens is the people repent. They go, oh, maybe God will show mercy on us. And uh, they say, let everyone turn from his evil way. Verse 9, who knows, God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. So they, a bunch of them repent, okay? Very interesting story. Because that seems to be the extent of Jonah's preaching, but it's all that it took for those people to repent of their sin. And Jesus has done all these miracles and awesome things. And, and He's healed people. And he's, he's given this great teaching that we talked about in the Sermon on the Mount. And He's done all these wonderful things. And they're saying, show us a sign that you're really who you say you are. Just to wrap up Jonah, the character of God is that that God wanted to show... God had compassion on these people. He loved them, and Jonah didn't. He didn't like them at all, and he didn't like that he was being used to tell them about God. And at the very last verse in, in Jonah, let's look at it. The very last verse in Jonah, Jonah 4.11, it says, this is God speaking to Jonah, and Jonah's all mad about these people. <laughs> repenting because he doesn't they're the enemy right and he said and should I not pity Nineveh that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who don't know their right hand from their left see this shows the character of God and the character of God is important to seeing where Jesus is at the beginning of chapter 13 the character of God is very important he said there's 120,000 people there they don't know their right hand from their left in other words they don't know anything they need to know about me. They need to know uh, what, you know, who I am. Also, it says, and also much cattle. That's God. <laughs> Not only is 120,000 people don't know anything, there's a lot of cows there. That's how the book of Jonah is. That, that kind of made me laugh today as I looked at that. Anyway, so we got these people with a very minimal teaching. 40 days, the city's going to be thrown down. And Jesus says, those people who repented are going to rise up and judge these people who have had all these great things done and had all this opportunity to trust in me and believe in me. So back to, back to chapter 13. You have a situation where Jesus is probably grieved, angry, frustrated, and having a lot of compassion. He's probably somewhat broken hearted at what he's done and how he's been rejected. And remember, Jesus was subject to human emotion. He was a human being. He was 100% human. He was 100% God. So he had some emotion that probably went down there and it says that great crowds followed him. So the crowds followed him and he got into a boat and sat down. It says in chapter 13, verse 2, Great crowds gathered about him, so he got into a boat, sat down, and the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they didn't have much soil, and immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they were withered away. 
Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some thirty fold, some sixty, some no, some hundred fold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So you gotta stop there for a second and think about this big crowd on the shore. They're following Jesus because he's done all these things. And Jesus gets out of the boat and he starts talking about farming. Now there's two there's two reactions that could happen here. If they're searching for what he's trying to say, they're gonna wait, what's this all about? The sowing of the seed and falling on rocky ground and falling in good ground and the birds taking it and falling on the rocks. You know, what's this all about? They would begin to think about it. But other people would just be going, well, I'm talking about farming, I'm talking about sowing. Yeah, we know that this happens. These people are a rural culture. They, they're they there in uh, in Israel. They know that, you know, this is, what, this is what happens because what happens is that there'd be these fields and they'd be all kind of divided by paths. So they use the path to go and then they would throw it onto the field and not try not to walk on it. So there would be these hardened paths. They knew that. They knew there were some places where there's thistles and some places where there's rocks. He wasn't telling them anything new. So to some people, it would have been unintelligible to talk about, you know, what what is what is the point of him telling us this? We, all, we already know this. Now when Jesus says this, when Jesus teaches this, in Luke it says that when he had said this, Luke records that Jesus, Luke 8.8 8 says, when he had said these things, he cried, he cried, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Like he's pleading, he's concerned. He's, he's wanting people to understand there's something important that you're missing. And really what he's talking about, he's trying to explain why there's unbelief. He's trying to tell them, this is why there's unbelief. Why there's some people here that, that, uh, that, aren't, that aren't hearing, that aren't seeing that I am who I say I am. But it goes on to say that the disciples came to him. Verse 10. The disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? Because they were going, okay, Jesus, why are you, why are you talking, a, talking a parable now? Why are you giving, basically a parable is like an analogy, but it just has one point. It has one main thing that it's trying to get across. And it's kind of a story that we can see, see the truth of, of what it is. My, when I was in grade six, or as you say uh, here in the States, sixth grade, <laughs> we, we, had, we had a teacher named Mr. Fuller. And Mr. Fuller would often say, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Anybody ever heard that saying? Mm -hmm. What does it mean? It means that you can't force anything upon anyone that they don't want to do. Right. Or anything. Yeah, you can take people. I mean, in his context, he was talking about the books and the things and the learning that was available there, the books, the you know, textbooks that we were supposed to read and study, and the different things we were supposed to learn and know. And but some people would would just kind of ignore it. And he would he would teach his best. He was a very good teacher. And he would teach his best, but he had this little parable: you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. So, so we have these little sayings in our in our vernacular about you know that are kind of like parables. So the disciples asked Jesus, "Why do you speak in parables?" And it's kind of to illustrate a point in a real concrete way. And so, but he's kind of shrouding it. He's kind of hiding what he's really trying to say. He's not explaining it to them, right? So the people on the shore are just hearing the first part, the first few verses, right? So 
one of the reasons for parables is that people are apt to remember stories and then they can think about what the story means as they think about the story. And I think that's one of the the, uh, the, main, the main reason for using a parable. The reason Jesus told the parables was to hide the truth from those with hard hearts who didn't want to hear the truth and did not want Jesus as their Messiah. Remember Jerry was talking about the, that it wasn't the Messiah they wanted. That's why he was being rejected. They wanted one who was going to come and defeat the Romans and, and take over and, and set up a kingdom in Jerusalem. That's the kind of Messiah they wanted. They didn't want this Messiah who was healing people and talking about uh, righteousness and the kingdom and repentance. So in verse 11 we have it, And he answered them, To you it has been given to know the secrets or the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. Now the word that's translated secrets there is, is mysterion in Greek. And it means a mystery. Now when we think of a mystery, we think of something that's really hard to understand. It's dark, it's difficult, and uh, it's mysterious. Maybe we can never really know what it is, right? But at that time, the people would have understood, well, a mystery is, it was a technical name for something uh, that we don't know from the outside, but when you get inside uh, with the teacher, you understand it, okay? And uh, someone who's initiated into that religion would know what the mystery is. But until you were brought into that religion, you wouldn't know. And uh, so, you know, when you think about mystery, we, it's it kind of a little different. It's, it's not really a, a secret as, as such as something that you could never know. It's something that you have to get into and look into to understand, okay? So there's a different. So the word mystery refers to what God knows as to what's going to happen in the future. Mysteries are secrets, divine plans for the future that He reveals to certain people. So if you got your Bible, one of the things, uh, one one good definition of mystery is in Colossians 1:26. Colossians 1.26 says, well, it, Paul is talking in verse 24 and 25 about how he's been chosen to be a minister to make the word of God fully known. The mystery, verse 26, the mystery hidden for ages and generations but now revealed to the saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Okay? Now let's get a picture of this. This mystery that's been hidden for generations, this thing that Jesus is saying to them where he says, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, is... As, as the story unfolds, it's going to be Christ in us, us believing in Jesus Christ, the hope of our place in glory in heaven. So when Paul says it, it's talking about it's something that the past ages and generations didn't know all this. They saw this Jesus Christ who was going to suffer, or this Messiah, I should say, who was going to suffer, and then he was going to rule on the throne of David. They didn't see this piece in the middle where Jesus was going to set up a spiritual reign in the lives of people who trusted and believed in Him for salvation. They didn't see that. You see? So when Jesus says to the disciples, you guys have been given to know something that has not been revealed in the past. Kind of like what Paul is saying here in Colossians 1. And the mystery is that Jesus Christ is going to indwell them and, and be in their lives and they're going to trust in Him for salvation. And the church was going to be resolved through the disciples. So when He talks to the disciples, He says He's talking about a secret that's been given to them. Is To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. To them meaning all these people who have just rejected Him, these religious leaders. These people were asking for more signs. 
these people who didn't see that he was the Messiah. He says in verse 12, For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who is not, even that had, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables. Because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Now the word understand is, you know, we have, it comes from a word that means where we get the word synthesize, okay? It's, it's a word, that, um, I don't know how to pronounce it in Greek, but it, it's kind of where we get words of putting things together. The word means, uh, let's see, where am I here? <laughs> to put together, as in collecting the individual features of an object into a whole, like pieces of a puzzle. Also, it involves a moral reflection, pondering or taking something to heart. So it means you put the, the things together in your mind and you take it to your heart. That's what understand means. It's not just intellectually grab it, but to put it all together and go, oh, that's me. I need to do this. I need to respond to this. So when he says to them, uh, hearing in verse 13, Hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. They don't put it together, who I am. They don't take it to heart. They don't put it on their heart. They don't, they don't receive it, that, that I am the Messiah, the Christ. And so he says, indeed, in their case, the prophet of, prophecy of Isaiah is, is fulfilled. that says, you will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. So in the, t in the context of what Isaiah was saying, we won't turn there, Isaiah was taught at a time when, when those people were being judged, okay? And what had happened was Isaiah had seen a vision of the Lord and His glory, and he felt that he was really sinful. And, and he was chosen by God to go tell the people, hey, you know what? I'm going to bring this judgment on you that you're not going to be able to see and understand because of your wickedness. And so he, Jesus is saying, the same thing is happening here. I've kind of had to pull back from being really uh, obvious about what I'm, what I'm here for and who I am because these people don't see, don't want to see. They want to, they, like we saw in, verse, in chapter 12, they want to accuse him. They want to destroy him. They want to discredit him. They want to, um, they want to accuse him of being Satan of being led by the power of Satan. And so for that reason, Jesus has to kind of close their ears to it. And, you know, that's that's something that we we kind of, it's we struggle with a little bit until we understand that there's there's something about these parables and, and kind of shrouding them for people who, who want to understand them, they will, okay? A parable reveals truth to the person who desires truth, it conceals truth from the person who doesn't want to see the truth. I thought that was a good quotation. In fact, I'm going to read the whole quotation to you, and I'm going to tell you something about the guy who wrote. It says, The parable conceals truth from those who are either too lazy to think or too blinded by prejudice to see. It puts the responsibility fairly and squarely on the individual. It reveals truth to him who desires truth. It conceals truth from him who does not wish to see the truth. Now when I read that, I thought, that makes sense. It's concealing to one person who wants it, and it's revealing to the, I mean, to who doesn't want it, and it reveals to the person who wants it. I found, come to find out that the guy who wrote that believed wrongly about a lot of things. And he was a universalist, which means that he believed that 
everybody gets saved, which is wrong, not what the Bible teaches. Many, you know, we've seen that throughout the um, things we've been studying so far. And he didn't believe in the Trinity. And I thought, well, how can a guy say something so clearly and yet not see it? <laughs> and I thought, wow, that's a perfect example of somebody who doesn't want to see the truth of Jesus Christ. But one of the things about these parables is to understand that it's merciful also by God. Parables presented God's message to the spiritually sensitive, so the spiritually sensitive could understand, but the hardened would merely hear a story without heaping up additional condemnation for rejecting God's word. Remember how he said, these people of Nineveh are going to judge you because all they heard from Jonah was 40 days and you're all going to die. And they repented. Here I am. I'm the Messiah. I've done all these miracles and you haven't seen it. So if he does more, if he does more uh, plain teaching about who he is, about being the Messiah, about the kingdom of God, he does, speaks to them more plainly and does more miracles, does more signs, and they still reject him, there's even more condemnation coming to them. Do we follow that? I want to kind of yeah. check check to see if we understand that. Anybody have questions about that? No? Okay. So that's why he, Jesus at this point begins to speak in miracles and uh, miracles, in parables. And uh, there's several more that come up in Matthew here and get to them right now, but the one that we get to is this one about the soil, about this farmer sowing the soil, sowing the seed into the soil. And basically it's talking about why people have unbelief, right? And so it talks about, in verse 18, um, Jesus says, hear then the parable of the sower. So he says to them, I want to explain to you guys what I told those people in a parable. I'm going to explain it to you because you want to know. Because it's important. Because you're searching and you're trying to find. And that's kind of a lesson to us. If we want to understand the Word of God, we need to go after it a little bit. You can lead a horse to water. <laughs> we, have to, we have to seek it. We have to seek it out. And so, so he, he tells them, Hear then the parable of the sower. When any, verse 19, When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand that the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart, this is what was sown along the path. So he describes the, the stuff that lands on the path and the birds coming in down and taking it. That's like the devil taking away something when you're not prepared to receive God's word. Okay? As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And then tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. This represents people that are easily impressed. But it doesn't last. They're impulsive. They're kind of half-hearted about, about the gospel. They want to hear it. They want to have it in them. Uh, they want it. It sounds exciting, but they really don't want to seek and find out more. And so the first time there's a temptation or a trial or something that comes against that, they're easily pushed off by it. The pursuit of that truth that they're looking for. So, remember I told you last week or a couple weeks ago that I was trying to understand quantum physics? You guys remember that? I'm happy to say I've completely understood it. <laughs> Actually, no, I haven't. So, I've, I've read a little more of it and I've kind of left it on the shelf for a while. Okay? Now, I think of two reasons for that. One of them is really hard to understand. There's really a lot of reading. There's really a lot of things you got to know. And I just don't care enough about it. 
<laughs> it's true. No. <laughs> if we're like that, to the Word of God, that's all we're going to know. Right? <laughs> but here in verse 21, it says, you know, we hear the flash, we want something easy. He receives it with joy. He wants to know about it, but he has no root. It doesn't take... It's like this seed that lands on, on, on the little bit of dirt that's on top of the rock. And it doesn't have any place to go with the roots. And, and it just kind of dies easily because the sun just beats down and there's no roots to support it. Okay? And so these, anything can come along. Wind can come along. The heat can come along. And it's gone. We can be like that toward the Word of God. We can act like it's, you know, okay, I like it to a point, but I'm not really going to seek out God and find truth. That's what Jesus is saying, this thing about falling on a rocky ground is about. And then verse 22, As for what has been sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. Okay? Chokes the word and proves some fruit. You know, uh, I was trying to remember something that happened when, when we were younger. I remember that we had a bunch of thistles. Uh, do you guys know what thistles are? Yes? yes? No? Yes, okay. Thistles are, when you, when you touch them, they, they sting you. And they, they, they make welts on your hands. They hurt. And they 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 grow really high, like four or five feet high, in the summer. And I remember we had this garden, uh, and my dad had me cut down the thistle. So I cut down the thistle with a scythe. Anybody know what a scythe is? <laughs> you ever see the the Grim Reaper? Mm. That thing that he has with the blade and the, and the handle like that. Mm -hmm. That's a scythe. Well, I used actually one of those to cut down the thistle. Got down the thistle, and uh, we actually plowed it under. Okay, we plowed it under, and you know, listen, knows what's going to happen here, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the next summer, there was way more thistle than last year, right? Way more. There was just like tons of it, and we we had tried to grow some potatoes there. It was good ground, really good soil. Soil wasn't the problem. The thistle was the problem. Okay? So, because we had cut down the thistle and left the seeds to get back in the ground, when we tilled it up again, there was way more thistle than there was before. And it choked out. We couldn't grow the potatoes there. It was very few, very small. And then I found out, I asked my mom on the phone yesterday, I said, how did you ever get rid of all that thistle? And she said, well, we found out through a farmer, who was my uncle, Alex, that if you pour water, he said that he had cut down thistle, and he had, it had rained, and that th the thistle had gone away. And so what they did was they took a bunch of water, okay, and they pour, they cut off the top of the thistle, and because the, the, the stalk of the thistle is hollow, the water would go down and would rot the root of the thistle, okay? And it would go away. Now, what a beautiful illustration of the Word of God. Now, when we think of the Word of God, it's the living water, it's something good, it's something powerful, it's something good for us, right? But it's what kills thistle if you get to the root of it. So, when we think of this, the cares of this life and the deceitfulness of riches choking out God's word, understand that if we go and attack that and don't allow that and, and let it die and get to the root of it and put it away, it's, gonna, it's not going to be a problem anymore. I thought, I thought of that when I saw this thing about thorns. This is the one who hears the word the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. The deceitfulness of riches just means that riches appear to be the thing that we want, but they're not. 
They deceive us. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands that he indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold and another sixty and another thirty. That's the mount uh, fold meaning the mount that seed multiplies, okay? So in some people it's going to be greater than others, it's even to say. But it's going to be God's word bringing f real fruit of repentance and, and, and the fruit of the Spirit in our life. So when we, when we think of these things, um, when these people would have heard this, they would have heard, thought of uh, things like in Hosea 10, 12, where it says, Sow for yourselves righteousness. Reap steadfast love. Break up your fallow ground. For it is time to seek the Lord that he may come and rain righteousness upon you. So they would have understood this imagery about sowing and reaping, breaking up the ground and allowing God's word to penetrate our hearts. They would have understood that. And it's not about the quality of that word. The seed is all the same. The seed that falls on the rocky ground and the stony ground and on the thorny ground and on the good ground is all the same seed. And we allow it to change us. Now I think of this time my dad came to visit us in Minnesota. We were going to this church uh, where this guy was a great preacher. His name was Tom Lundin. Tom Lundin for the folks on <laughs> <laughs> Tom Lundy was a really good preacher, and so I wanted my dad to hear him preach. I thought, well, that'd be great. But we got to church, and another guy was preaching. I don't know if that's ever happened to you. <laughs> but uh, another guy was... Today. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm not kidding, God. So <laughs> the main guy wasn't there. And so this other guy was, was, was kind of really slow and boring with the bird, and he wasn't very good. And I remember sitting there thinking, oh, man, this is not very good. This, not, this guy's not too good at preaching, and I wanted my dad to hear Tom Lundin. And afterwards, I said, yeah, I really feel bad that our main guy wasn't there to, to preach. You know, you would have liked him. And he says, you know that guy, what that guy said about the word, and what he said there, I really like that. That was really beautiful. He said, I know he's kind of slow and, and kind of methodical, and but what he said was really good and how he brought, brought out that part. And he described the part. But I remember thinking, you got something out of that? <laughs> and I remember thinking that, you know. So when we hear the Word of God, it's how we receive it that matters. It's not the quality of the preacher. You know, when you get excited about something somebody says and some great preacher and some great situation, we can be like that, the one who has no root. You know, we can, we can be fascinated by it. But it doesn't take a root in our heart. So when we have this opportunity... To hear the Word of God, to study the Word of God, to know the Word of God, to have all these, these years and centuries of Bible teaching, people preaching the Word of God. And we can look it up on our on the internet, on our phones, and our books. And we have all this opportunity to go to churches and know about Christ. I wonder what Jesus Christ is going to think of us when we just kind of have an attitude that ah, I got something more important to do, something that's choking out the, the pursuit of God, the pursuit of the truth. But I, my heart is kind of closed to it, you know? Are we receptive to who Jesus is? Have we repented? Would he be frustrated with our response to who he is and how he's revealed himself and his miracles and his teaching. Have we ever asked ourselves that? Would be we be frustrated? We have all this opportunity. I, I think of this one time.
one time I was in uh, Saskatoon. Anybody know where Saskatoon is? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Saskatoon is in Saskatchewan. It's probably straight north of North Dakota. North Dakota? North Dakota. <laughs> and uh, I was in a mall in Saskatoon. And I was hoping uh, Cameron would be here because he'd appreciate this more than most of you. Do you guys know who Wayne Gretzky is? Mm -hmm. yes. All right, you do. Okay, yes. good, good. Good. You do. He's, for those of you who don't know, he's, he's the best hockey player that ever played. He's the best team sport player that ever played. He's better than Michael Jordan, who was at basketball, <laughs> statistically. Better than LeBron James at basketball. Better than anybody in football. Better than insert the best soccer player's name here. I don't know who he is. <laughs> Michael Messi is in uh, soccer. He's the best. And this one time I was in, in the mall in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, and it was one of the first two years that he was playing, and he was there. And it was at the time when people were kind of, like, oh, I don't know about this guy, I don't know if he's going to be great or not, or he's going to be good, or he's going to work out at all. And so he was on this little stage and he was promoting something, and it was like 15, 20 people maximum there. That's it. Wayne Gretzky, the guy who came to LA here and you know, played for the Kings, and won five Stanley Cups in Edmonton. Um, so I, I'm walking by and, and thinking, well, we should go and, you know, there's only 15, 20 people there, maybe we could go meet him because he was meeting people, right? He wasn't very many. But we didn't know who he was. We didn't think he was. We knew who he was and he was important enough that we recognized him, but I think had we known how, you know, that he'd become legendary like he is, I think we might have stayed and, you know, got some selfies with him. We might have to get an Instamatic camera, because back then we didn't have uh, cameras on our phones. In fact, there was no cell phones, kids. Polaroid? <laughs> totally no cell phones at that time. Polaroid? Yeah, I know, there's, there was a time, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember thinking, you know, we could go get an autograph or something, you know, and say hi to him and shake his hand or something. But we didn't even bother doing that. Mm. And I think of these people, you know, that were there at the time of Jesus. And he's healing people. And he's, he's doing all these great miracles. He's showing compassion. He's saying, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. He's showing his power over demons. He's talking about the kingdom of God. And he's doing these incredible miracles. They didn't, they didn't recognize who he was. But we have an opportunity now, in hindsight, to look at this and go, Oh, wow, that was Jesus. There he is. There he is right there. And we can trust in him, and we can follow him, we can seek him out today. We can find him. And so that's why I asked the question, you know, we have this opportunity as we hear the word of God, as we see all these stories, to, to seek it and go after Christ and the knowledge of Christ and the knowledge of the, of the Bible. And that if it is will for us, I wonder how he'd feel. Like when you go down to the, to the down by the sea, and you know, like those people have heard the word, and they've been around it, they've seen what I've done, they've read about it, they've heard it taught, but they're just not responding in repentance. They're not coming after me. I hope that we would would have that recognition of Christ today and have a have a heart that says I'm going to take this in I'm going to take it in and let it be mine let it be the thing that changes me and brings fruit in my life there's a, there's a verse in, in Ezekiel I'd like you to turn to now Ezekiel is kind of hard to find I'm just kind of closing it off here but I want to 
turn there. Ezekiel, there's, uh, if you go to the middle of the Bible, there's about Psalms, Proverbs, Isaiah, Jeremiah, then Ezekiel. Okay? So it's a little past the middle of the Bible, chapter 33. And Ezekiel is a great preacher. Ezekiel is a pretty amazing guy, uh, apparently, because um, it says that God has to speak to him one day, and he says to him in verse 30, and he says, As for you, son of man, your people who talk together about you by the walls and at the doors of the houses, say to one another, each to his brother, Come and hear what the word is that comes from the Lord. Sounds great, right? So Ezekiel, God is saying to Ezekiel, Ezekiel, these people that stand around and talk at the doors and tell each other to come and hear you speak, what the word of the Lord is. Well, he goes on. And verse 31, They come to you as people come, and they sit before you as my people, and they hear what you say, but they will not do it. For they, for with lustful talk in their mouths they act. Their heart is set on their gain. And behold, you are to them like one who sings lustful songs. Uh, that word lustful can also be translated very lovely or sensual. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily mean uh, that it's a lustful song. But you get the idea. They sing, sing songs with a beautiful voice and plays well on an instrument. For they hear what you say, but they will not do it. No, I'm just going to leave that there for a second. This is a describing of these people that they want to hear the word of God like it's a nice song being sung to them. I hope we don't have that. I hope we don't have that in our heart that we would just look at the Word of God as well. It's interesting. It's like this person with uh, who sings these nice songs with a beautiful voice and plays well on an instrument. Oh, we like that even today, right? We, we love all that kind of thing. But are we hearing what God is saying to us in the Word of God? Are we hearing that? God has to point out to Ezekiel, Ezekiel, these people aren't really going to do it. They're coming out to you and hearing you, but they're not doing what I'm saying. And so when we hear the Word of God, again, I pray that it's something that penetrates our heart and changes, and we respond to it. And we put the pieces together and we say, I need to repent. I need to follow after Jesus. I need to come after Jesus. Father in heaven, I just thank you that your word is clear. I thank you that you want us to know you and yet you want us to seek you also. And you are there for us if, if we reach out with our whole heart and we come in faith and it says, your word says that you are a rewarder of those who diligently seek you. Mm -hmm. And so I pray that you would reward us as we, as we try to understand you and know you and respond to you and put the pieces together and not blind our minds to you or blind our hearts to you or ignore you or try to find fault with this Lord in some way but we would just accept it and receive it and allow it to bear fruit in our lives so in Jesus name Amen, Amen.